Hello and welcome everyone um, to the Domestic Violence Housing and Technical Assistance Consortium's COVID-19 Weekly Special Topic Series. Today we're discussing how direct cash assistance to help survivors maintain housing stability, otherwise known as flex funding, is utilized to address the economic, housing, and safety needs of survivors which we all know are all exacerbated by COVID-19. Today we have with us Shelby Lowry Leonis from LifeWire, a domestic violence housing program in King County, Washington. And she'll share with you how they're finding their well-established flex funding program to be an effective strategy for addressing the expanding and deepening COVID-related needs for survivors. Then we'll hear from Jennifer DeCarly and Janice Jenkins from the New York City's Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, along with their partner Shobana Lap Powell from Sanctuary for Families, who will share how they are distributing flexible funds to directly support survivors in need across New York City through funding provided by the Mayor's Fund to advance New York City's COVID-19 Emergency Relief Fund. We're also joined by my colleagues, Chris Bilhart from the National Alliance for Safe Housing and Miriam Durrani from the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, who will help facilitate the discussion. And my name is Suzanne Marcus, and I'm also with the National Alliance for Safe Housing. Throughout the presentation, please add your questions in the comment box. We really want um, this to be a discussion so I um, encourage you to put your questions in the comment box and we will be leaving ample time for Q&A at the end of the um, presentation. I also wanna mention that you'll receive a link to a survey at the end of the webinar. And I encourage you to take a minute to fill it out if you can. Um, DVHTAC is very interested to know how all of you in the field are coping with COVID-19 and the innovative strategies you're using and the barriers you're facing so that we can be responsive in our technical assistance. Also, I wanna mention that this webinar will be recorded. Okay, Jenny, if you could advance. Um, I wanna share with you a little bit about the Domestic Violence and Housing Technical Assistance Consortium. We're a group of TA providers with, ex with experience at the intersection of domestic violence and sexual assault and housing and homelessness. And we're funded through a collaboration of federal agencies. Prime at DOJ, the Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs at HUD, and the U.S. Interagency Council on, the, on Homelessness. Jenny, if we could advance. Thank you. And before we begin, we want to help set the context for this discussion, given that the intersectionality of domestic violence and sexual assault, homelessness and housing, and COVID-19 create profound disparities that impact our work and the people we work with. The Center for Social Innovation, SPARC, supporting partnerships for anti-racist communities, studied eight communities across the United States to understand racial inequities in homelessness and found that in total, 78% of people experiencing homelessness were people of color. And by comparison, the general population of the US was 74% white, 12% black, and 17% Hispanic Latinx. Rates of American, Indian, Alaska Native homelessness were also disproportionately high, three to eight times higher than their proportion of the general population. And through Spark's work, domestic violence, IPV, SV, sexual violence were a common thread across genders and age ranges of people of color experiencing homelessness. I also want to note that NRCDV just developed an infographic on this intersection that you can find a link in the chat box we will place for you. It's hot off the press. We're excited to share it. Um, next slide, please. We also know that COVID-19 is impacting communities of color at much higher rates. As of April 28th, Black Americans are dying at 2.6 times the rate of whites, or 26 deaths per 100,000 people. 
and many states are effectively erasing Native Americans from their data sets by classifying them as other. State tracking by demographics by demographic have found severely dis disparate rates of infection of death or death, excuse me. Next slide, please. And research suggests that racial residential segregation is a fundamental cause of health disparities. Communities of color disproportionately live in neighborhoods that are further from grocery stores and medical facilities due to historical racial discrimination and redlining in housing policies. And many people of color live in federally assisted housing, including public housing and Section 8 programs that are often in segregated neighborhoods with less investments. Next slide. It is, in, it is within this context that we're working to address survivor safety, economic and housing needs. And we'll now pivot to our speakers to discuss how flex funding is proving to be an innovative strategy for providing support, particularly to survivors who are unable to access or marginalized by mainstream services. So with that, I'll introduce Shelby Lowry Leonis to discuss their work at LifeWire in King County, Washington. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Hi everyone, this is Shelby Lowry Leonis again from LifeWire. Um, I have a ton of information that I want to try to get to uh, get through in this short amount of time. So I'm going to go as quickly as I can, but please do put questions in the chat and totally happy to provide my contact information at the end if anyone has any follow up questions or anything that they'd love to chat and figure out with me. Um, I wanted to start by just giving a little bit of history on LifeWire and the journey with flexible funds that LifeWire has had and really talk about the things that we've learned over the years and talk really about the journey from where we started and where we are now uh, with COVID. And so I also do want to preface that LifeWire has been utilizing flex funds for many, many years, far before I even came to the agency. And the philosophy and framework of using flex funds had already been pretty grounded when I came in about five years ago. And the pieces that I've really been a part of since being here at LifeWire uh, is really building on those foundations and fine tuning the way that we're doing things and constantly trying to do them better and do them more equitably. So LifeWire was part of a pilot project back in 2018 with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We were one of four organizations that agreed to participate in this project and to accept um, a fairly large pot of funds. And at first the agency was not really sure what we were going to do with them um, and hadn't really decided, you know, how are we going to spend these funds and what model are we going to use? And at the time, it's important to know that we were already set up with a pretty strong infrastructure to do something new and uh, to try something new and different and innovative. And at the time, we had already had established some pretty unique models of our transitional program, our shelter program, and rental assistance programs for survivors that were pretty unheard of and unique at the time. Uh, that we do still have at the agency. Our shelter is a model that is set up um, in a master leasing situation with individual units and our transitional program specifically serves survivors who are also um, experiencing or um, wanting support around substance use. So it really made sense for LifeWire to take on this new project and we were already really used to thinking about housing models pretty differently. So at the time we really asked ourselves what is still a gap? What can these programs that we already have not do that we are really still seeing is a need? And we decided at that time that just having flex funds to be able to pay for and do things that these other programs couldn't was exactly what we wanted. And we really wanted to be able to, you know, sit in front of a survivor and just say, what do you need to keep you and your family safe or more stable? And what does that look like to you? And how can we help you get there? And getting those funds really, you know, now we had the money to back up those questions to survivors. So I do also always like to be transparent that it was very rocky the first few years as in as is any new thing that an agency is trying. I think that 
um, before really becoming the trauma informed DVHF, you know, housing first focused model that we function under now, we were really siloed at the time, uh, both between the direct service programs and the other departments at the agency, but also within uh, direct service teams. Things were very fragmented. There was very little communication going on between services and the finance department, for example, or the shelter team and the community advocacy team. So we noticed really, really early on that that was not going to work and that the departments were really, really, really going to all need to collaborate with one another and be invested in this work together. So since then and over the years, we've noticed a lot of really important considerations and like I said, constantly working to try and make this better. Uh, we, again, like I just said, we really very, very quickly learned that the teams needed to function a lot more fluidly. And we recognized that the entire agency really needed to be behind the survivor-driven trauma-informed equity-based framework. It really needed to be internalized. It needed to be, you know, there needed to be buy-in from every corner of the agency, from the top all the way to the bottom. Um, and we asked ourselves, you know, how can we provide services like this if we aren't engaging with each other like this? And so we really needed these frameworks and these philosophies and these values to stick. And we needed that information and that knowledge to really be instilled and embedded and passed down to new advocates as they started and as new folks entered the agency. We have always really valued letting the survivors make the choices that work for them. Uh, the most important question I think we've continued to ask ourselves over the years is what does equity look like when talking about flex funds and serving survivors in general? Um, how are we reducing barriers to give access to the most marginalized? How do we avoid being gatekeepers of these funds? How are we prioritizing the use of these funds, you know, how do we make decisions? How are we making sure that we are reducing biases in every, um, in every way that when we're making decisions? Uh, another crucial piece I always like to emphasize is the really, really strong communication that is needed between the services part of the organization and the finance department. The finance department really does, again, need to be bought into the same framework and be invested in the work. Uh, from, I would, I would say that one of the big, the, one of the things that has made this most successful at LifeWare is our finance team and the relationship that we've been able to build over the years. Our finance team deeply understands the services that we are offering, advocacy, what it looks like. They deeply understand the needs of survivors, the reality of the situations that they're facing. Um, they have an intimate knowledge of the funding streams and they'll really support us in being flexible and creative and knowing you know how can we spend the money in the most creative and innovative ways while also still getting the funders the invoices and the documentation that they need i you know go to my finance director pretty frequently and say here's a survivor's need i have no idea how we're going to get around this documentation requirement what can we do and she's the first one in there like okay well this requirement we could do it like this and this this and this they're constantly you know on board with us and supporting survivors uh, the best that they can as well. Uh, diverse flexible methods of payments are something I would also really want to emphasize. Having as many different options for advocates or staff members to be getting money out as quickly as possible, whether that's checks, whether that's company credit cards, whether that's access to cash, um, utilizing cash apps at your agency, it really will you know, this will give agencies the freedom to really imagine, reimagine what advocacy can look like and really push advocates to think about what, what does flexibility really look like and what do survivors need. Uh, so we did quickly see how magical it was to really be able to stand in front of someone and say, what do you need? And then actually be able to do it. And so since 2008, we have really worked on fine tuning this, like I said, um, working on the infrastructure, the policies and procedures, the different processes, and then really focused on staffing and making sure advocates are skilled and trained because yes, this money is phenomenal, but it's really that advocacy paired with the money that um, brings such success and great outcomes. It's that advocacy, that support, that other human being on the ground with survivors. Um, so for now we have, 
kind of shifted a little bit. Um, we are very, very privileged and very lucky to be where we are at with flexible funds. At this point in the agency, we have a dedicated advocate that does oversee our entire portfolio, flexible funds, the disbursement, the tracking, the reconciling. Um, all direct service staff are trained extensively on the use of flexible funds. All advocates have access to these funds anytime they are working with, with a survivor or speaking with a survivor on our helpline. They can pretty quickly do a request um, and then do the check request, get the cash out the door, make a credit card payment online. And we do have specific processes and you know a couple of forms that we do use in tracking and logging procedures that I would be always happy to chat with anyone about how this could look for your agency. Um, and then when I'm thinking about, when I think about how we make decisions and how we really view the, the use of flex funds, I think the thing that sticks out the most to me is just being low barrier. And I think really thinking about race identity and access to resources. Um, to access our flex funds, we are not requiring IDs, social security numbers, you know, proof of employment letters. We recognize that that is a huge barrier for not only folks fleeing violence, but oftentimes for undocumented populations. Uh, we don't require that someone need to come in person to the office to meet us physically to sign any form for us. Uh, we also realize that access to transportation and child care and time off to be able to come into this office or stop by are all privileges that a lot of folks do not have. And so we also really keep at the forefront of our minds that we are to a system and systems are and historically have been oppress oppressive and racist and they that unnecessary barriers get put up for black indigenous and other persons of color. So a big part of the prioritization and deciding who gets what is really based in this marginalization framework and safety is a, a huge part of this. We think about who historically and currently has had the least access to resources and services. And that has been, again, Black, Indigenous, and other persons of color. And less access to resources often means less access to safety. So a lot of the conversations that we are having with the survivors we're working with is just really exploring what's going to work for them. How will this aid in your long-term stability? Is this a sustainable option for you? Will this provide a bridge to stability for you? Do you know what advocacy pieces or other support do you really need that's going to support with this in the long run? Do you need connections to job search, employment navigators? Do you need to maybe move somewhere cheaper that's more affordable and we can help support moving to that new location. So it's so much about that advocacy piece. And we really do try to connect people to resources to bring in that community engagement piece and to braid together resources to maximize the impact any chance we get. So if someone, for example, calls in for energy assistance they're needing, we know that in our part of the county, there are energy assistance programs that exist for a lot of different folks. And so we might talk to them about that, see if they've tried to utilize that and say to them, you know, there's this great resource over here. Do you have access and an ability to apply for it or to get the support over here? And then we can look at using some of our funds that we considered to use for the utility bill on something else. So what else are you needing? You know, do you need some food? Do you need some basic needs? Do you need any other bills um, covered right now? So really being creative i truly believe that you can tie most things to housing or stability whether that's fixing of a car whether that is legal or immigration fees to be able to obtain work status whether that's a moving truck whether that's gas money uh, there are so many ways to tie things to housing and to stability they all really impact one another uh, so with the infrastructure that was already in place, it really did make our transition into COVID a lot less destabilizing and chaotic than it has been for a lot of other folks. We had so many process, processes in place already to be able to get money out the door pretty quickly uh, without having, without needing someone to come in and do anything. So it has allowed us to really, really keep functioning uh, really, really well. We haven't had to shift much, but we have seen a bit of uh, trends or patterns in the needs that are coming up for survivors right now during COVID. We have definitely had to limit the types of things that we're wanting to prioritize. I would say that normally 
really, we'd consider any type of request in normal times and try and figure out a way to meet any sort of need that a survivor has. And for right now, we have had to kind of shift over to prioritizing five main needs because the increase has just been so significant in the number of calls that we're receiving um, with everyone being out of work and impacted by COVID. We've had to really prioritize things like past due rent, um, health and medical type stuff for folks who are um, at high risk of COVID or have been exposed to COVID. We've had to really prioritize safe, unique safety needs and making sure folks have access to a safe cell phone or internet access to be able to apply for unemployment or apply for the resources that they're needing. A lot of folks um, have needed cell phones for us to get them track phones to be able to have them even be able to text or call their advocate safely because they are now stuck at home with their abusive partner and do not have access to a safe phone or computer right now. Um, We've seen a huge increase in basic needs across the board. We have done so many gift cards and purchases for food, for gas money, for cleaning supplies, for masks, for um, just all those things that are very, very expensive and a lot of folks do not have access to them. We have utilized a lot of e-gift cards, being creative with using apps like uh, Instacart or any, you know, Amazon Fresh that can deliver groceries to people who might not have an ability to get to the grocery store or it is too dangerous for them to be out in public places at grocery stores right now. So really trying to be as creative as possible um, and still getting that money out the door. We have had to a lot of leasing offices and apartment complexes have been closed or the offices have not been open and they have not been accepting, you know, rent checks or checks or money orders like they normally do. So we've had to figure out how we can get rent payments to landlords for survivors. And that's looked like um, online ACH bank transfer payments and the use of increase in the use of promissory letters that we're using uh, to pledge these different amounts until their leasing offices open back up. So uh, a lot of shifts and we lastly really want to focus on to just the increased attention in how we're serving the undocumented populations. This crisis is obviously hitting a lot of that population extremely hard and when thinking about who did not have access to these stimulus checks, who are not eligible for most of the mainstream resources and we're having a lot of conversation conversations with those folks around the fear of the public charge rule and what it means to them and the fear that they carry to reach out for rent assistance, for food assistance for their families. Um, so we're really, really trying to focus our energy and funds on that population right now. And again, being creative in how we can get the funds out. Uh, we work with a lot of folks who often live in non-traditional living situations. So they might not be on a lease or be the main, the primary leaseholder, or they might be living with a friend or family member who is undocumented that is not comfortable you know sharing any information or filling out a w-9 form for us and so we really try to figure out okay how can we maybe go get a money order instead or how could we go get someone maybe some visa gift cards or support with the utility bills and the food assistance and the cell phone bills and everything else right now so they can dedicate the money they do have or the funds that they do have towards getting those rent amounts covered um so lastly, really just want to emphasize flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. It is so key uh, when going after funds or grant opportunities. It's so important to diversify your funds and the options that you have as much as possible so you can really build up a diverse portfolio where the most needs can be met. Uh, for example, we are really lucky to have several different pots of flex funding at this time. And so we're often really able to say, okay, this, this pot of funding can really pay for this type of thing, but not this type of thing. But, oh, we have this other pot over here that is a lot more flexible and it can pay for things. Or we might have a private donation that is specifically meant to serve the LGBTQ community. So we really want to prioritize, prioritize those funds for that community. Um, and I think it's just such a unique time right now that we are in and thinking about flex funds and access to cash assistance. I've been thinking so much about, you know, how the federal government, even with the current administration, gave, while 
concerns and problematic in some ways, gave no strings attached money to millions of families in the United States. And, you know, in some ways kind of just used a flex funds framework or housing first framework and, and that people need money right now. So give it to them without putting up a ton of barriers or deciding whether those people deserve the money or worrying about what they might go spend that money on. And I'm really, really hopeful that this could be a bit of a turning point and that a lot more attention can really be focused on uh, why access to quick cash assistance and flexible funds are just so crucial uh, in the lives of survivors. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Shelby. That was really interesting and helpful um, to hear how a program like yours that's been um, well established um, pivots to meet this um, need or these new needs. Um, and so now I want to um, turn the presentation over to um, what exciting work is going on in New York City. Um, Jennifer DeCarly and Denise Jenkins are with the New York City uh, Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence. And Shobana Powell is with Sanctuary for Families. They have a newly established flex fund program um, to serve survivors citywide, um, specifically to address the COVID crisis. So with that, I will turn it over to you all. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, this is Jennifer to Carly, and I'm going to start our presentation. Um, first, I just want to thank um, all of you for inviting us to participate today. And Shelby, thank you for sharing so much wisdom and knowledge. Um, we have much to learn from you as we stand up a brand new flexible funding program in New York City. Um, and I mean brand new. We launched on June 15th. <laughs> so we are um, completely not well established and a pilot um, program and we really look forward to continuing conversations with Shelby and learning from her her wisdom and years of experience. Um, as Suzanne said, I work at the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence. Um, we say NGBV for short and in that office uh, my role is to oversee the five family justice centers in the city which are, um, I'm sure folks know on the call, really um, you know, one-shop models, uh, supportive services for survivors of domestic and gender-based violence. Um, in the city, we have about 40 community-based organizations that work out of those centers, and we're really lucky to work very closely with Sanctuary for Families, who is our partner in this new flexible funding program. Um, so my role today is in the next like three to four minutes just to give a background on how we received this funding and how we quickly set up the program um, in partnership with Sanctuary. And then I'm going to hand it over to my colleagues, Janice Jenkins um, and Shobana Powell to talk about the details of the program and our plans for evaluating the program. Um, so my office uh, received this funding through private dollars as part of the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City. As everyone knows and has heard in the news, New York City really was the epicenter of the COVID crisis in March. And our private uh, funders really were wanting to help and really help the most vulnerable population. So we received a generous donation from a private funder through our city's COVID emergency financial relief fund, which was part of our mayor's fund to advance New York City. And it was really geared toward helping survivors of domestic and gender-based violence, um, the most vulnerable populations who had needs that were exacerbated by COVID. Um, and those needs were in the categories of safety needs, housing needs and financial needs. And the purpose was to quickly stand up a program that could get money out to those survivors um, in a very low barrier, client-centered um, philosophy. And we had been really, we were really thrilled to receive this funding, but to also do it in partnership with Sanctuary. Our office had been looking to receive funding for a number of years to stand up a flexible funding program because we've been so awed and you know really amazed by the work going on in Washington and, and really this new best practice of helping the most vulnerable find safety and stability through these creative um, programs. So we've been trying to stand up a program and we were really, uh, you know, it sounds odd to say lucky <laughs> with the COVID crisis, but we were um, really thrilled to be able to stand this program up in response to what was going on in New York City with COVID. So, what makes New York City's program so unique is that at the Family Justice Centers, we work in partnership, as I said, with over 40 agencies on site. We also have, you know, another 30 to 40 agencies that work in community. Um, and we have 
work very closely with them as well. And so we needed to stand up this program quickly and partner with a CBO who could really be the um, kind of city contracted uh, direct service provider of this program, but receiving applications from all of those programs. So Sanctuary for Families is doing that work with us. They've been a longstanding partner and Shobha and I will talk more about what they do, but they are receiving applications for these micro grants. Um, the funding allows us to provide approximately um, an average of $1,500 to 200 survivors um, for those immediate safety, housing, and financial needs, um, but to receive applications from all of our on and offsite partners of the New York City Family Justice Centers, which is about, as I said, about 80 partners. Um, so that is quite a, <laughs> quite a kind of a lift. Um, and as I said, we launched, we received the funding in March, April, we announced it in May, and we stood up the program on June 15th. So we've only been accepting applications for about a week and a half. Um, and we're really trying to adhere to the philosophy of client centered, low barrier, um, really helping the most vulnerable uh, survivors and most marginalized communities. And so I'll turn it over to Shobhana now to kind of give you more details on how it's been going for the first week and a half. Shobhana? Yeah, sure. Thanks everyone um, for being here. My name is Shobhana Powell. I am the director of our micro grant program. I work at Sanctuary for Families and um, we're a large um, anti-gender based violence organization in New York City. Like um, Jen was saying, we are working really closely with the mayor's office. This is like a great example of partnership, I think, where we're emailing and talking almost every day, um, working it out. But just to give you all an update of where we're at, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, where we're at data-wise, case examples, um, how we include survivors, and then Janice is going to talk kind of about measuring our impact. Um, so I was just checking because I had a note that we had 80 applications uh, before this webinar started and then I checked just now and we're up to 83. So that's the way it's going. Um, so it's been about seven business days and we have 83 applications and we just hit $150,000 in requested funds, which is half of our full amount that we have. So it has been really interesting rolling out and we're not surprised that people are applying because the need is there and we have fierce advocates, um, but it's a lot. So we're happy, we're just trying to make it work. Um, just to give you a little bit of a breakdown on that, um, a lot of our applications, uh, we're happy to say, are coming from um, smaller culturally specific organizations in New York City, which was one of our hopes, was that we could get this funding out to organizations that don't typically have the same privilege and access that our larger orgs do. Um, and a lot of the survivors that we're serving are undocumented. So they're not able to meet a lot of their needs because they don't qualify for public support to meet those needs. So we're really happy about that. And it kind of ties to um, what was being spoken about earlier around um, equity and access and race. Um, and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to be pulling some of the data on exact percentages and breakdown by um, different disparities. So to give you guys um, some case examples, um, it actually, on my end, I feel like I have the best job because I get to be looking at all the applications and interacting with the service providers. Um, and it has been fun because the providers are amazing. That's not surprising, but it's kind of nice. I'm a clinician myself and I'm like, oh, there's, there are so many others out there like me. And I call the provider and I'm like, hey, can we talk this through? I don't know how we can pay for this need because we like um, they were saying earlier, we can't get the tax ID from the landlord. They're unwilling. Okay, let's talk about what else we can pay for. And we have this like fun back and forth and also just hearing how hard providers are working with their clients to advocate for them to get these needs met. By the time they get to us, it's not like they've done nothing. They've tried everything. Um, and I'm like floored by the case plans they have in place and their plans for the future. So that's been really nice. But just to share some actual examples um, of just kind of like creative needs that we've been meeting already in seven days. Uh, we had a survivor who her abuse was um, it involved her toilet, so her toilet was damaged. And so we were able to pay for a new toilet for her as well as dog food for her um, therapy dog, which is something that most, you know, 
programs are not set up to pay for. It doesn't fit into a box. Like no one, I don't think most people have on their list toilet and dog food as essential needs, but they really are essential needs. Um, so that was really exciting. And then another one was we had a client who was a burn victim um, and um, it affected her eyesight and she really quickly needed glasses in order to function and we were able to meet that need very quickly. Um, it's hot out in New York City and another survivor needed an air conditioner because her child had severe medical conditions and they had just moved out of housing with the uh, partner who was causing harm and so we were able to get that air conditioner for that client. Um, let's see, they're all fun. There's lots of good ones. I have a whole list. Another one that I thought was interesting and you know kind of culturally relevant was a client um, was able to divorce her partner in um, under Sharia law but was not able to divorce her partner under U.S. law um, due to COVID-19 and issues getting into the courts. And so she was able to move out, but she's having some financial issues because she hasn't been able to access that divorce. And so we were able to help with furniture. Um, and then another one that I thought was interesting was just a classic case of, I think, what we see a lot with survivors. We had um, a client who just has so many needs to the point where she didn't know what to ask for. And so it's been kind of a team effort between me, the provider, and one of my colleagues who's been doing our purchasing to help come up with what those needs are because the client needs everything. And she's so humble and she's like, no, I don't think I need that or that sounds too expensive. And so kind of working through like, no, you really do need clothes for yourself in addition to your kids. Like we see this list of things for your kids, but what about you? And kind of doing some of that back and forth. Um, and then the last one I'll share because I have so many. Um, <laughs> is um, I think a, a good example during COVID-19, people need laptops right now in order to work um, and, and to be connected to society. We know isolation is so um, important to combat for survivors. We have a survivor who they, the abuser was controlling her laptop access and was able to view what she was doing on there. Um, and to the point where like she would have to, she had a plan with a service provider that for this 15 minute break, she could step out of the house and call the service provider to just have some connection to the outside world. And so we were able to um, purchase a laptop for her so that she could have one that's safe. And we were able to deliver it to her work, which is a safer place because otherwise her um, abuser would have been able to access the laptop. So that was like a really interesting, I think, and creative one. And the last thing I wanna say on that is, um, also to that partnership with your finance team. I literally just was emailing back and forth with our finance team. We have a survivor who um, the invoice for her rent does not match the name on there. It does not match her name because it's under her father's name who is her abuser, but she needs to pay rent. Normally we would need the roommate or the landlord to send us a little memo that says, oh, this, this person lives here even though their name isn't on the invoice. Well, for her case, that's not safe. Um, because the father has connections with the landlord. There's just no way to make that happen. And so it kind of took, it's an interesting chain of advocacy where the provider is advocating with me and then I'm advocating with our finance team. And it really worked out because they are trauma informed. And I explained that there's a safety issue. We don't want to put them in that situation. And they said, you know what? Yeah, I, we're okay. If, if the provider can just send you an email that says, yes, that client lives there, let's just do that. And uh, I think it was like just a good example of how we can break down barriers if we do have a team effort. And then um, the last thing I want to say just is on survivor inclusion. Um, Jen and Janice, I don't know if you know this, but I'm doing my, um, currently we're working on my dissertation on um, how organizations often re-exploit or socially exploit survivors in our attempts to have the survivor voice included in our work. And so I'm kind of doing um, my research and, and my work around replacing that exploitation with equity. So what does survivor equity look like? And we're really trying to implement that in the work that we're doing on this project. So we'd have a paid survivor consultant who is an expert, not only um, because of their lived experience, but also their work in the field. And then also um, he's an LGBTQ plus rights activist and an immigrant rights activist 
So he has been informing and consulting um, kind of on our whole project and process and really giving us some good feedback from that perspective. And that's not to say that um, people on our team are not survivors. We know that a lot of people in this field, a lot of people in the world are survivors, but there is that unique perspective of someone who has taken that risk of disclosing their survivorship and are able to inform from that perspective um, of someone who has gone through the process and gone through the services before. So he's been really helpful in kind of guiding us and saying, even if someone's just applying online on behalf of their client, the wording that you use in that application is how the client or how the provider is going to speak to that client. So it really does matter. Um, so that I think has been really beautiful. Uh, yeah, I see Kathy put like hashtag equity, not exploitation. Yeah, I love that. Um, so I'm going to pass it over now to Janice to talk about kind of how we're measuring the impact um, of this whole project. Thanks, Shovana. And thank you all who have joined today. Um, as mentioned, I'm Janice Jenkins and I work for NGBV um, and I, along with Jennifer, help to oversee the operations and programs um, of our family justice centers. And so I want to give you some information about the way we are evaluating um, and provide and collecting data on our very new program. Um, and so with this being a very new program um, and New York City, um, you know, flex funding being a new strategy, New York City is using citywide to support survivors. Um, we knew from the onset that we needed to be able to demonstrate not only the need, but also the impact of our program. We um, at NGBV and along with um, Shobana and many other of our providers really believe in um, this model. And so we want others to believe in it as well. And so we knew for sure that we needed to do some evaluation of our program so that we can prove um, how great of a resource this um, and strategy for supporting survivors this really is. And so we wanted to um, do a few things we want in our evaluation um, and collection of data. We wanted to kind of demonstrate, um, of course, the need, as I mentioned, so that we can um, broaden the program, um, create future programs, um, have this be really a widely used tool for supporting survivors. We also wanted to understand better who we were serving, you know, understanding that we would be um, supporting survivors of domestic and gender-based violence. We really kind of just wanted to better understand what their needs were, what were the barriers around um, their housing and financial stability. And then of course, we wanted to be able to enhance our program model, it being very new and very much a pilot, you know, we are kind of and almost kind of building the ship as we go. Um, we wanted to be able to take a look post pilot to um, see how we can, and, and even actually, actually as we're going and as we're building, um, we wanted kind of immediate feedback from survivors, from providers on how we can improve um, the model that we've created um, so that we are better serving. Um, survivors. And so in this process, we are engaging both providers and clients. And so both will be asked to participate in a survey. Um, for survivors, the survey will be anonymous and voluntary. And so there's no um, mandate or requirement for them to receive it to take the survey in order to receive the, the funding. And so we, we, it was important for us to make that very clear um, to survivors when they, um, and providers, so they can share this information with um, the clients that they would be applying for. Um, but it was important for us to get this information out to survivors. So hopefully to increase their willingness to, um, to participate in the survey, um, but also just wanting to make sure that we are um, moving in our principles and um, philosophies and making sure that we are best, using best practices in supporting survivors through this program um, and even in our survey. And so 
we plan to have a, um, there's three surveys, very short surveys, but, th but three of them. Um, one at the initial stage, so right after a survivor, um, or sorry, pro provider submits an application on behalf of a survivor, we want to be able to reach out to that survivor and just get a kind of basic understanding of what some of their past and current financial and housing um, situations um, are and some of the, the barriers that they face in um, obtaining stable housing um, and securing um, finance um, and, and economic stability. And then, um, and so that's our initial survey, um, kind of our pre-survey. And then we wanted to just get a, um, a quick kind of immediate impact review and, and quick feedback loop from survivors. Um, and so we plan to do a one month as well as a three month um, survey. Um, and so that's one month following receipt of the funding, the micro grant, and then three months after receiving the micro grant. And so we're asking survivors to participate in those two surveys. Um, and those surveys, very similar to each other, will really kind of help us to understand how the microgrant program helped to improve their financial and housing situation, um, how it met their needs um, around safety, their, um, their comments and feedback on program satisfaction. So really understanding from them, um, you know, what were the pieces of this program that worked really well for them and what were some of the pieces that didn't. So for example, you know, did they receive the money, um, the micro grant fast enough? Was it in a, in a time frame that um, was expeditious and, and swift? Um, so we wanna get a better understanding of, of things like that. Um, were they treated with respect when the service provider was helping them to fill out the, the application? Um, and if there was any need for us to help connect them to additional services for ongoing support. Um, and then lastly, we want to understand if this helped to improve um, their kind of well-being. So not only improving safety, but just also their general well-being, so their mental health, that of them and their children. And so as Shobana mentioned, um, we have a survivor consultant who is helping us um, on this project and giving us some honest feedback um, on how we're wording um, the application and as well as how we're wording our um, survey questions. And so it's been extremely helpful in that. And so we're trying to reframe and rephrase questions to eliminate bias and, and survivor blaming. So instead of asking, for example, do you, um, do you think you'll be able to pay your rent next month um, you know, after receiving this grant? maybe the question needs to be rephrased and asked as, do you need help to pay future rent? Um, and so really kind of looking at how we're asking the questions before um, we begin to roll this out um, is really important to us. And so we're hoping through this, um, we'll be able to get some really helpful information to really demonstrate that New York City is operating a very new strategy, new program that is really impacting survivors' lives, um, the lives of them and their families um, in, in a way that we hadn't been before and that this model could be replicated um, across the city. Um, through different organizations um, and, and, and agencies that are serving survivors. And so we're really helping, hoping that this will prove that. And then also we're hoping to get more funding. Our funding is limited um, with this being a pilot. And so we're hoping that through this survey, we will prove that there is a real need um, to scale this program. And so we're hoping that we, we can entice other funders um, to, to support the work that we're doing. Um, and hopefully, like Shelby mentioned, it will bring about um, 
a real diversity of funding so that we can um, be even more creative and in helping survivors through this flex funding micro grant program. Thank you. Great, thank you, Janice. And thank, thanks to all four of you. What a rich conversation. This is Chris Billhart from NASH, longtime fan of flex funding. <laughs> and it, it's just been a great conversation and we're so happy to hear from your, your different perspectives how much you have in common in terms of the values behind your programs um, and how flexible you're being in the way that the money gets spent down. Um, we have a few questions in the chat. We actually had a, um, a, some questions that people sent in when they registered for today's um, session. Um, and many of them, surprise, surprise, fall into the category of funding. <laughs> So um, you mentioned um, folks from New York City that you had a grant from your um, mayor's office that, that the mayor made uh, some funding uh, set aside specifically for this um, and you're seeking other ways to, to get it funded to keep it going. So maybe this question is more for you, Shelby. You did mention uh, wanting to have diversified funding that you can go to for different purposes um, when requests come in. Can you talk a little bit about what some of the funding sources are for your program? Yes, of course. So LifeWare currently has uh, about seven or eight different pots of flexible funding. Um, they do come from a variety of different areas or levels. We get a couple of different private donations, absolutely. We get um, a specific private donation from the Pride Foundation, uh, specifically to serve LGBTQ survivors. We get a couple of different pots from local cities in our county. So that is coming directly from the um, Human Services Commission at those cities. We have one county level source of uh, prevention style flexible funds. We get a grant from the local chapter of United Way, the Seattle King County United Way. And then we also, the last big one I can think of is our VOCA flex funds, our VOCA enhancement flex funds. So that would be access going through your state VOCA office. That's great. Thank you, Shelby. And yeah, we did want to mention uh, about VOCA that the final rule in 2016 expanded the allowable uses of VOCA funds that come through your state VOCA administrator. Uh, and many states, uh, sometimes through their state domestic or sexual violence coalition, have um, uh, managed to set up programs with that funding that really have allowed a lot of the victim service providers to expand their ability to provide direct assistance for housing. And flex funds is a huge part of that. So some of you may live in states where that's occurred. Um, Washington State, of course, is one. California, Pennsylvania, Colorado others around the country. So those of you who are interested in acquiring um, flex funds can certainly join with your state coalitions um, and other providers to um, advocate with your state VOCA administrator to um, direct some of the funds that come to the state through VOCA Chris, um, Chris, in that Chris, way. Chris, could I add something? Sure. Yeah, I just want to say too, I would really encourage folks to just be super flexible or sorry, super I think the thing that I always think of is even when we are applying for whether it's county, whether it's city, whether it's state, whether it's even like federal HUD COC funds, I think it's always great to see how flexible the funder that you're going after funds through will be. And I think anytime we're applying for a rapid rehousing program, a rental assistance program, whatever kind of housing program or funding source it is, we always try to include in those applications some sort of pot 
of uh, flexibility. And I know that even with the HUD rapid rehousing program that we have, uh, they too allow us to have a tiny pot of what they call client assistance dollars that are obviously not as flexible as the private donation types of funds are going to be because it is HUD federal government funds. But I think just really being creative in any opportunity you have to potentially put in applications a request for um, some or all of that money to be as flexible as possible. Exactly. Yeah. Include it as a line item in budgets um, that you're putting in to many of your funders. And it, it also spreads the word about how an what an important resource this is and, and how essential it is to the work that you're doing and in, in, coupled with the advocacy that they might be also funding you to do. So, yes, great creativity. Um, and we did have one question about uh, whether individual donors support your FLEX program. Um, uh, you mentioned one, well, you certainly mentioned uh, private donors, Shelby, um, but I'm wondering, do you have a, is there a capacity in your program to accept individual do donations for flex needs that survivors may have? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that really goes back to, along with creating that really good relationship with your finance department, that really good relationship you can build with also your fundraising. Uh, the fundraising folks at your agency and really solid communication of like what are the survivors needing and and helping your fundraising department really uh, be able to talk about flexible funds and to be able to kind of market this way of doing things um, we do get occasional private donations from local community members that hear about our services or maybe they're friends of board members. So we can accept private donations like that. I think I've definitely seen an uptick in those types of private donations since COVID because a lot of folks are like, how can we get involved? How can we support agencies? And um, I know a family member of a staff member just a few weeks ago donated $10,000 and specifically wanted that funding to only be used for gift cards for gas and groceries. And so that was you know $10,000 that we were able to put pretty quickly into a into a pot that just is going to be able to go to food and basic needs. So yes, totally. Yeah, I think it's true that a lot of individual donors want to know my dollars went to this person or, you know, certainly they don't know what person, but <laughs> it went for a specific need and that feels like it, it made quite an impact that they were um, able to help ha make happen. So thanks for that. Um, I'm wondering, there's another question about whether what your standard procedures are when paying people directly. So when the funds are going right to the survivor, um, how do you handle that? Um, and also there was a question about uh, disaster relief payments and how you handle that tax wise. So either the New York City folks or Shelby have anything to, to say about those questions? Wanted to give the New York Your folks side. a chance. I'm happy to, <laughs> I, I'm happy to talk about it. Wanted to give the other folks a chance. Um, we typically, our first uh, attempt is always to pay vendors directly. We do limit giving funding do directly to clients or participants. Uh, the one kind of exception to that is with our cash need, any cash needs, and so. Like I mentioned, we have credit cards, checks, and cash are probably the three main primary payment methods we use. Um, ideally, we're going to pay a vendor directly, so we're trying to make payments directly to the utility agency, to the landlord, to the car mechanic, to the whoever directly. Uh, for check payments, which is the most preferred type of payment, the one form that is required or document process that's required is obtaining a completed W-9 form, which is a standard IRS document. It is, can be filled out really, really quickly. And so most landlords and most businesses and entities and individuals are fairly comfortable filling those out and giving it to us. And then if for some reason they are not comfortable or like, I know we've paid like GM or Chrysler, like huge companies. And we're like, there's, I'm never going to get someone on the phone. That's going to give me Amazon's W9. <laughs> so for those type of things, we, we then go to credit card payments um, or trying to make yeah an online or over the phone credit card payment. And then if that is not an option, cash is kind of the third thing that we try. And that's typically where we see 
direct um, distribution to survivors happening. And the one thing that we do internally is just to have one simple form be signed, uh, basically showing that that money was handed off from a staff member to the survivor directly as kind of a checks and balances. So if I'm going to meet someone or they're stopping by and I'm going to be handing them cash, I have them sign a really quick form just their signature and date that shows that they did receive that money from me so I can give that back to my finance department. And we'll oftentimes send pictures of that or email those forms if they can't come in person to sign it and they can even respond and say, yes, I received this money um, or something like that. Perfect, thank you so much and time has flown. Um, I wanna thank everybody for attending today and mention just a couple of really quick resources in the chat, you'll see that we've got a uh, flex funding FAQ that was developed in partnership between NASH and WISCADEV, the Washington State Coalition. Um, you can get the link to it right there in the chat. We also have put together a document that details all the, the uh, parameters around the CARES funding, the different funding that came down um, in that act and um, what it can be used for. We can send that out in follow-up information. And the last little plug really quickly is the slide you see in front of you right now is a reminder about that short survey that Suzanne mentioned at the front of the, the session today. Um, you can link to it um, right there from the slide and that would really help us know what's going on in the field and what the needs are. We're looking at um, how we can um, pull together a huge bank of information that's gonna help um, everybody out there responding to COVID and then um, moving through COVID um, when we do get to do that. <laughs> so um, thanks everybody so much for being here today. We hope you got something from this uh, webinar. I know that I did. Um, and we'll um, be back again with a uh, next session. Um, I think we're taking a break uh, next week because of the 4th of July holiday, but we'll be back in early July with our next um, COVID-related special topic session. Thanks everybody.